This is the Instant Speed Podcast, episode number 22. I'm Flake. Nice to see you, or not see you. Nice to be heard, I suppose. Our guest today will be Dalen Mack, but before we get to that, friends, we've got some news. And again, this episode is brought to you by FabDB.net, your premier source for deck building tools, collection management, and simulated booster drafting. Upgrade your account, fabdb.net. Get access to all the cool features. Bring your game to the next level. Also, BCW Supplies coming in clutch for this episode as well. Let's get to the facts, ladies and gentlemen. The ProQuest is underway. Do you want your PTI? We'll get to one of those ProQuests. I know that all these slots are so coveted because a lot of these have been signed up for so long ago, but I, I'm telling you, if you can find one, sign up and get on a wait list if you can. The one I was at most recently, uh, there were a few no-shows, so who who knows you might get lucky the metas have been uh, published uh, for week one and they're uh, available on fabtcg.com and you can see not just what all the heroes represented look like but the top eights and what that flushes out to be as well as the wins and you can see a little bit of skew here from week one and how will that translate into week two and beyond that's what we're going to talk a little bit about with dale and mac but how about some more rules because we all love rules this game is so complex and so layered that an article diving into a little bit about those rulings the new comprehensive rulebook 2.0 and all the little subtle interactions that need clarification so go check it out there's a whole bunch in there that may affect you so you want to be on top of your game when you're piloting your deck and you know that you are making the right call check that out uh, the comprehensive rules on uh, fabtcg.com also the announced recently the calling in taiwan another calling has been put on the calendar this one's going to be taking place friday april 22nd through sunday april 24th calling taiwan add that to the list friends and hey have you had some trouble with your pro quests well i have an article for you yes sometimes it's always okay to shamelessly plug oneself. And in this case, I've got an article up on Channel Fireball that deals with how you can get through those misplays. Yeah, maybe you made a mistake and it's just haunting your dreams. Well, I wrote about a little bit uh, in terms of how you can deal with that and get past those misplays and improve as a player. All right. One player that has been improving and still has conquered some of the mountains ahead of him is Mr. Dalen Mack. He joins us on the podcast here for instant speed right after these quick messages from fabdb.net all right so it finally happened i top eight at a pro quest this year in the pro quest how amazing is that and i gotta say a lot of that has to do with the fact that i was tinkering with decks and practicing a ton and how did i get that done well i was on fabdb.net using all the wonderful tools and resources at my disposal i upgraded my account to premium and it was off to the races building a wicked cool prism list i was able to check out all the stats and not only that i was able to go ahead go to the settings and print a deck list i didn't have to fill it out by hand what am i an animal come on print it out get it done go to fabdb.net upgrade your account to premium your premier source for deck building tools resources and collection management go ahead upgrade your account you will not regret it the Instant Speed Podcast welcomes back ProQuest winner. He's also a recent draft pick of the Tampa Bay Bandits. But most importantly, he's my sensei, my teacher. Welcome back to Instant Speed, Dalen Mack. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Well, I probably not as great as I'm feeling right now because I top eight at a ProQuest. We'll get into that. That is big news. <laughs> That is headline news, but we'll talk about it a little bit. But first, I want to get to a few things. Obviously, this is not your first rodeo here on the show. And ever since that day, you and I have uh, we've met in person. We've hung out. We've had a lot of good laughs and a lot of good uh, uh, heart to hearts about just uh, what Prism is and what Prism does. But the, mm -hmm. most importantly, it's been a, quite a month for you. Not only did you get engaged, not only was it your birthday, but dude, got you got drafted by the Tampa Bay Bandits. So tell us a little yeah. bit about this month for you and how, how special it's been. Yeah, it actually has been a pretty, pretty special month. Uh, you know, got drafted on my birthday uh, by the Tampa Bay Bandits, which is really, really cool. Um, and then, you know, go and play some fab this weekend and, and win, uh, win a pro quest. So it's been a... Um, it's been a very, um, very good month for me. Um, it's just, it, it's just really rewarding that um, hard work's paying off. You know, football wise, and uh, you know, 
off the field as well in card games. So it's a very rewarding month. There's a lot to there's a lot to sort of take in here. And uh, if you were to power rank all of these major events in your life, uh, assuming that your your fiance is listening, <laughs> <laughs> how would you power rank all of these big achievements? Uh, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I'm honestly not sure how I'd rank them. Um, it, it definitely did feel uh, felt really good getting drafted. Um, it, I, I kind of knew I was, but like when I got drafted to the NFL, um, I kind of knew I was getting drafted there too. But um, it's just I just try to take it all, just take it all in and just enjoy. You know, it's a blessing, and yeah, yeah I just try to take it all in. Don't really want to. Can't really rank it. It's just all. It all feels good. <laughs> well, we'll creatively edit this uh, if, uh, in case something like your fiance just catches wind of this podcast and wants to uh, just say like, no, the, fee- the the clearly the engagement was the number one thing ever. Uh, ultimately, though, <laughs> like you yeah. mentioned, there's a lot of prep that went in, not just f- from your athletic career, but the card gaming career as well. And you can kind of breathe easier now because a lot of those major elements of nervousness or preparation are kind of behind you. So you can kind of mm-hmm. chill a bit. And I know that you're going to a few more pro quests because a, they're awesome to participate in, and there's still really some, there's some still some swag to be won. But talk to us a little bit about the uh, the pro quest and preparing for it, because your previous tournaments, you I know that like this is not a jab at you, but you, there were a lot of situations where you were winning in and didn't yeah. quite cross that finish line. But how did it feel, first of all, to actually convert on the winning in and then get to the top of the mountain? Yeah, um, you know. At Philly, you know, I played on my last round, my round six was a winning in situation, and uh, I lost to Chain. And, um, I mean, just a bad matchup. Um, I wasn't really playing the things in my deck to make the matchup winnable for me. I wasn't playing any, like, D-reacts or anything like that, so I basically had to go all ors into the matchup. Um, it was very bad, but it was also my first time um, playing playing Prism. So then after that, I got back with the guys, um, tested, we went over some things, and I went to my pro quest um, from my locals um, that, I, that I always go to. We had 64 players. All of the ones in Texas have been insanely huge. Um, and I was in another one in a situation, had to win to get in, and um, lost to Viscerai, which is another, you know, Rune Blades literally just destroying me, which has always been Prism's, like, hardest matchup. And so um, I didn't, didn't want to get down on myself. Um, I knew I was playing well. You know, I was just running into a couple of, unfortunate situations there um but you know i just got back into the lab started pra- practicing you know tuning tuning my things out of my deck um and then finally this week um my, my, i was in another winning situation and my opponent was actually undefeated um he was only undefeated and i got paired up i was x1 and uh there's just i have too much pride to ask someone for a win because i would never want someone to hang that over my head like oh man remember that time i had to give you the win I'm like uh, i would never do that so um i even think he said he thought i was gonna ask him for the win and i was like nah man like i would rather just take this three hour drive back home than to ask for like an actual win so i played it out he was playing this ride and uh i was able to get it i was able to get it and i uh, got the top cut and you know got the top cut and was able to win out all my games in top cut and won the event and then you Part of them along that line is you you a beating that guy uh, to get into the top eight, and then again uh, just beating the rest of the field, all other seven players in the top eight, which is very very impressive considering the fact that, like you mentioned, it, it was a tough climb. And I know that I've been part of this journey as well. And you are infinitely a better card player than I am. I'm re- I'm ready to admit that here on on this <laughs> semi national broadcast, regardless. I've learned a lot from you on prison, but I know that part of this has also been me just witnessing you along this journey of learning prism. And um, that's the deck you played, the aura build. I just want to know a little bit about your thoughts about this deck and the journey that you went from first picking it up and trying to understand it and some of those key elements about understanding how this deck operates. Yeah, so like originally, um, originally, um, you know, when I first got added to the Discord, um, I was on Starbo. I thought I had a really good Starbo list, and um, you know, I, I was bragging about it. And uh, Matt Volks joined the um, joined the the chat, and he was like, Just "Let me let me see the Starbo list." And uh, I was like, "Yeah, sure." You know, I showed it to him, and I was like, "I think I play it plays well in the Prism." And he looked at it and he said, "Yeah, this is it would get destroyed by Prism." And I was like, "Oh, really? Well, I mean, you know, let's just play and test it out, right?" It got bodied. So after that, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to just play Prism. Like, 
I'm just going to play Prism. Um, did a lot of theory crafting with uh, Matt Folks. You know, we've become really good friends. Um, Brian Basoko, you know, we test daily with him. Um, Austin Yost, all those guys, Tannen, Blevins, you, you know, we're always grinding. And uh, basically, we just kept, uh, you know, the way the game is going right now, all these pro quests, I mean, lists are just constantly evolving, evolving, and evolving, and getting better week to week, getting more fine tuned. Um, so, yeah, and you, it's funny because you've been on this journey with me. We both picked Prism up literally at the same time. So, yes. you've been on the journey with me as well. And um, we're getting the results. <laughs> we're getting well, the results. So, yeah, that, that's good. that's the beauty of it. I find is that again, in I've mentioned this a few times to various different people is the fact that all the heroes feel and play very differently. That it's mm -hmm. not just a matter of picking up a deck and saying, "All right, just run with it." I mean, some are easier to pilot than others, but Prism is just a whole different beast. Playing at instant speed, being able to understand when to, you know, drop in a particular aura, how to prioritize auras. Uh, sideboarding yeah. with Prism, I think, is a very important thing as well. Um, yeah. And like you mentioned, it, it's not without its its antidote. It's a very strong deck, but like you mentioned, Runeblade gives it gives it fits sometimes. But in mm -hmm. in my progress with this list, there's there's a lot of little elements I found of learning what to do and how to play and when to cheat things out. And that is something that I know that you have taught me very well, but along that journey, you had to learn these as well. So yeah. um, if you can give just a couple quick tips about Prism um, Prism Aura Build, about um, like, for instance, for, for me, one of the most important things that I got caught with that um, you one of those mistakes you only make once was, you know, when your opponent passes priority with a go again still on the stack yeah. and you cheat out an aura and they come back at you to, to destroy it. These are little subtle things that you don't necessarily realize because they're in so much of the subtext of the rule set. So what are some of those, you know, subtle little rules or tips that you've learned on Prism that might help somebody who is just picking up the deck? Yeah, so I know a lot of people are... It, like, it's always very tough to switch classes in flesh and blood at least i've always found it very difficult because i was playing old dome i was playing lexi and then i moved to prism and it's like completely different game you know you're playing on your turn you can play on your opponent's turn um knowing when to sequence things um i would say the number one thing is to understand um how layers work the the, the actual chain like when you can respond to stuff um how to respond to stuff and like when to do it on your turn or your opponent's turn and for the most part, like, in the Prism deck, the only thing you really want to do on your opponent's turn is play Genesis, unless you can, like, cheat out a Merciful and just kill your opponent with the Arcane damage or something like that. Um, or, like, a, a um, Soul Shield goes to Arsenal and then you're, like, Vestus is live. But a lot of people aren't playing Vestus right now. Um, it actually, it's, it's like, it's hard to, um, I can say that, it's, it's hard to, just have like a set play line in your head like oh i would do it this way and it, it's hard to do that in flesh and blood in general because there's no set play lines in the actual in, in the game itself but for prism it's actually not that hard when you actually have a hand and you're in the situation and then you can kind of work it out it's like okay this is kind of what i want to do in this situation or you know this is how i want to respond to this happening because they're all instants right so like pretty much anything anytime something happens you can respond to it it's just knowing like what they're what your opponent is trying to do and it, it's just really it's way easier when you're in the actual situation so i know a lot of people are scared to pick it up because it's like oh when do i do this when do i do that but it's easier when you pick up the deck and actually you know start playing it and you're you have the cards to play the situation yeah and that's what i've picked up from playing so many of these reps with you and with everyone else and, and in these tournaments is the fact that, you know what, like until you're there with the cards in your hand and you have the reps under it, like the theory of it is so much different than the practical, uh, you know, the, the, pra the practical element of picking up the cards and playing them. And I always find that in, in any deck, there's a, there's always a level of when you pick up your cards, you kind of know how they kind of connect. And sometimes certain lists, you know, like, uh, for example, um, you know, playing like a Katsu list, if you look at your cards, typically, you know what you're pitching, you know, the order of which you're playing the cards. But um, for uh, a list like, you know, even Viscerai, but Prism specifically, it's hard to pick up your cards in your hand and understand 
understand what you're holding, when to play it, etc. There's so many extra layers that only comes, that muscle memory is only developed with a lot of reps. So uh, those yeah. are very important tips, again, because yeah. Prism does play within those margins of instant speed on and on, through different, uh, different layers yeah. of the stack where you can kind of, like you mentioned, cheat in that merciful retribution, get that arcane damage in for lethal potentially yeah. and, and such. A lot to, to keep in mind, but Talking about the rest of the field, I know that we've seen snapshots of different metas around different pro quests in different locations, but they seem to more or less be balanced into what I've, I've this this triangle of doom, this Bermuda triangle of, of these three heroes right now that are kind of in this, I don't want to call it necessarily a rock, paper, scissors, but there's a, a situation where one beats the other, you know, Viserai can, can dunk on Prism, Prism can handle uh, Starvo, and Starvo can deal with Viserai, and it's just this, this th- three-way going on. Um, it, is it really, truly this three-stack meta? Are there any other heroes that you think can break through? Can you tell us a little bit about what your interpretation is of the current meta and its evolution? Yeah, I th- so I think I think the meta is pretty soft. Um, um, yeah, I think the meta is pretty soft. Deck lists are still evolving, but like it's pretty soft, right? It's Prism, Viserai, Starvo, and then the rest of the field. I do think by the time um, by the time Indy comes around, I think Viserai will probably be the deck to be, only because the new OTK build, right? They're playing red unmovable, so they can kind of handle the Okano turns uh, better because they're playing that card. And then also, um, this ride plays well into Prism. But like, I was talking to Hayden Dell about it today, um, literally probably like an hour ago. We were talking about um, like the Viserai Prism matchup because I was asking him like, "Hey, what do you do against Viserai?" He's like, "Yeah, it's just a pretty tough matchup." But like, there's, I'm not trying to throw shade at, at anyone like in the community, but like, it's there's not a lot of good Viserai players like in this game. Like it's very, it's a very hard deck to play. Um, and the hands can be like, I, I feel like Viserai is a, is, is a deck of like, if you have a bad hand, it's like really, really bad. And when you've been playing against Prism, like if you stumble and don't have go again, it is probably like, I don't want to say it costs you the game, but like depending on what the Prism player's hand is, it can put you way, way behind. Because if they get like two auras out and you follow up and don't have go again, and you can only attack one and they put two more out, then at that point, it's not even it's not even beneficial for you to um, even attack the words anymore. Like you probably should just, it, as bad as it sounds, you probably should just ignore them and start going face because, I mean, you're just never going to clear them. They have four auras out, and you can only, I mean, unless they're playing lead the charges, which I guess some people are, but, you know, it, it's very tough. And Viscerize are like a very, this is just a very tough deck to play. But I do think that the good Viscerize players will be very much rewarded at Indy because, like I said, it's playing. It seems like it's playing better and better in the Starvo. Um, we've tested a lot in the Discord, and it's looking like, you know, the OTK version almost seems favored. Uh, the matchup kind of was fifty fifty, but like it now it's looking more like Viserai favored. And um, I think the Viserai player has to play. They have to play well to be a good Prism player it, to make that matchup actually just like really really bad. So, but yeah, I, I, I think it's those three decks. Um, I haven't really looked at much of the other decks myself. Um, I kind of don't even want to, you know. <laughs> and I, don't, I just, like, I only want to play things that are unfair, right? And, I mean, Viserai having split damage throughout the entire game with Arcane and Physical and an OTK plan and then Starvo having, you know, Dominate Strats and Prism being able to, everything's an instant. Like, those are the only decks that I see right now that are doing stuff that is just insanely unfair for where we're at in the card game on, like, set five or six wherever we're at yeah so those are the only decks that i want to even look at everything else is like you know good and you know you can do well with them but i don't think it'll be very hard to take down a tournament when you're running into unfair decks and you're playing a fair deck yeah it seems like especially like you mentioned like a lot of these heroes have this extra element because it's you know starvo might not be the one like you could go tall with like an earthbriar and you could swing like a a, an absolute Mm -hmm. champ with earthbriar but if there's no on hit effect who the hell cares Mm -hmm. it's the oaken old it's the crippling crush you know it's these that are really uh devastating with the dominate effect so they're you know that type of go tall swing hard build has that going for it along with the hero and something like this right like you mentioned you're going it might not be the most aggressive but when you're coming in for a 
it, with a bunch of damage split over so many various different sources, it's very difficult to digest. So that has that going for it. It just it's it's hard to to stop all the damage. Whereas Prism, like you mentioned, it just gets out of control. And what I've really found is that. When you're playing as Prism, eventually you create a crossroads for your opponent where they have to decide. You know, if they're not if they're not running, even if they are running, go again. It's one of those mm -hmm. attacks. You know, if they choose to go face, no problem. You develop your board, and it becomes very difficult for them to come back. You just need a yellow, and it's off to the races. But yeah. for um, for for opponents who who don't like, they eventually figure out like, okay, if I'm not addressing these auras, I have to go face, and that decision that they make is oftentimes one that it, it, in itself takes a lot <laughs> of practice game. to figure out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so when you say that, you know, there's not there might not be as many good, really good viscerai players as as it may seem. It, it's it's possible, and for me as a prison player, I love to hear it because <laughs> I feel like. Any, I don't want to say any clown can pick up Starvo and play it effectively. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that it. The, I think the, the um, the cost of entry, so to speak, to pick up Starvo, uh, really lies in the cost of the cards, not in the skill ceiling that you need to have to to swing with it effectively. I think what determines a good Starvo player is like kind of how they play the mirror. Um, you know, the prison matchup just is what it is. You know, they either have the red unmovables for. Oak and old, or they play the instance out when you open all them, or you know. But that matchup is, I mean, that matchup pretty much is what it is. And then into the viscerai matchup, right? Like the viscerai player is pretty much going to take a beating all the way down to like below ten life, right? So like if you're on the OTK plan, which I think is the more beneficial way to to approach the Starbo matchup as viscerai, um, you really need to make sure that when you OTK them, you kill them because they're likely holding another dominated swing that's probably going to win them the game if you can't handle it. And at that point, you probably already used up all your equipment. So, like, it is going to be game. So, I saw um, Brian Basoko um, in the finals, and someone was on the OTK plan, and Brian was at 40, and the guy presented like 28. And that's just not enough to, you know, Brian just took it all, went to 12, it's like whatever, and then clap back and kill the guy like that's you know yeah so what's i think you have to be a very very good viscerai player but like if you are a good viscerai player then like you are probably destined to do very well at indie the uh finals at the pro quest that i was at we recorded in uh, if you don't want to hear the result of it because we actually plan on producing it and and and, and like uh, publishing the, the the finals match with like casting over the top, but so if you don't want to know the <laughs> result, just block your ears for the next couple minutes. But that final was Starvo versus uh, Viserai, and mm. at a point the score was forty to eight for Starvo because it was just this massive beat down and like you mentioned he just kept accumulating and accumulating and accumulating more and more rune chance wasn't really doing a whole lot and eventually he just airmailed them directly at starvo's mouth and that's basically how it it, it, it ended up like it was a lot closer game yeah. but it seems like it's just you're 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 just kind of counting the oaken olds that you have to swallow and counting the crippling crushes that you got to digest and that and eventually as you're building these rune chance and you're building this rune chance you just got to hope that eventually there's a like a point where you have an opening that you can actually do something but it feels like starvo if you if you catch a pulse baby it's like you, you just hit the ground running and start swinging for the fences it's a it's a tough out and and normally like for viscera they they want to you know, against a deck that has constant hand destruction like um, like Starbo, they kind of want to, you know, get that Sonata in Arsenal and kind of leave it there for the rest of the game because no one's playing CNC right now. CNC is, like, I think pretty pretty ass right now. I don't think it's really... <laughs> that is a scientific <laughs> term. I, I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's really good right now. Like, right, like, Starbo has crown. Um, this ride doesn't really care if you to block two cards and then play more to tie, make some rooms, room chance. So they don't really care dedicating two cards to block a CNC. And uh, the only benefit you have against, against Prism is to, to pop up an aura. And, you know, I mean, I guess if that's your only option, um, CNC kind of overlaps into other matchups that just aren't really relevant, but I, I wouldn't be playing CNC. But um, to, to back on Starbo, though, like they, they, they kind of want to, um, awesome with that sonata and just leave it there so they don't get their hand ruined and you know it goes away but you can't really do that because you want to be playing un red unmovable from arsenal so like if you're playing red unmovable from hand it's like you know you're kind of going against you know your your original game plan so 
it's a it's a very awkward situation for them um, to try and like have those sonatas in hand or those become the organized and kind of hold it with the constant hand destruction that Crippling Crush and Oakenhold and are presenting. So it's it's but like you mentioned it's it seems to be like it's a three stack meta that's what it's probably going to change uh, go through and we've seen sort of some of the numbers fluctuate lots of viscerize lots of star wars more prisms are kind of popping up and every week it's just this new snapshot and one of the things i'm really hoping for is you know once this weekend scroll uh, passes by is i'd like to see some of those others bubble up as being uh potentially you know not not just um viable but also you know sneaking in there i know that there's like a reiner that snuck in somewhere um yeah and and there there are certainly options but as we progress every week for the past little while every little snapshot we see has been less and less of the other it's all been kind of one ofs and then it's that core group of three like the there's this big three that exists and everything else is just filler it's just you know uh it's kind of like practice squad stuff it's just they're 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 there to plug holes so to speak but um if there was one that you would say could actually make a dent not necessarily be favored not necessarily uh, have a prayer but could at least sort of put a dent in this in this big three what would you say might have a chance like is Lexi? I'm mean, Lexi's been a, around. I mean, it's been yeah, it's been that, kind of I'm, this fringe hero for a while, ever since the the uh, Isaac Jessen kind of brought it uh, to the forefront, and you've seen it peppered a little bit here and there. Ice Lexi being a thing, but it hasn't really busted through. I, I think Lexi is like the one that probably could break through, but like if they're running into a lot of prisms, I don't think they'll be doing well. Um, that matchup seems unfair. <laughs> Yeah, pretty pretty much unfair, right? Because you got to shoot; an, they don't have weapons, so you got to shoot an actual arrow, which means that like you either, it, 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 unless you have a zero cost arrow in hand, you basically have to use all the cards in your hand to load two arrows and shoot. So like, because you because you want to still be applying pressure, so you're not just going to load shoot an arrow straight at an aura and just pass like without doing actual damage, because then you'll lose. So you have to five at you and then shoot another arrow. And but at that point, like if you're using all the cards in your hand, you're not revealing. For your leader effect so now your deck is like very very bad um you i like i feel like people are only playing lexi because they they have a they think they have a good star Wars matchup <laughs> i don't really think that they do um i think they can apply pressure and like that some of the on hit effects are annoying for the star Wars player but you know over the course of the game i do think that like star Wars will eventually you know win the deck that I think that would be good if Prism wasn't around is I think Odom's like very nicely positioned. It just sucks if you run into Prism because it's an auto loss for them. Like very, very much an auto loss. Um but I think I saw an Odom player with some with some spice for uh Viscerai and I really liked it. I don't want to leak his stuff, but he has a really good list. I don't think he, he loses to the um to the OTK. You can't when you have 60 life, but that's all I'll say. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Yeah, so I think Oldham probably would be the one if, if Prism wasn't around. But other than that, um, the meta is just, like, I mean, the meta is just super soft. Um, I think by the time Indy comes around, everyone will be so well-versed in their, their you know, their deck, right? Like, they'll have an, a whole, an, an insane amount of info from all the pro quest. Um, you should have countless reps against, like, the triangle of doom so like they you know i think everyone will be able to play really really well um because of the amount of info that has been provided and the meta being solved so i think indy is going to be um a dog fight and i think um if i had to pick a deck that i think does really really well in the event that's going to be highly represented that's probably that might shock some people i would say viscerai like i do think if you're a really good viscerai player you will do very very well at um at indie so yeah but i'm taking i'm taking prison that's so. what i'm thinking in my head is like yeah. do I, I like it's, it's twofold number one i'm actually very much enjoying prism i think that that's a, a, a it's just a very I same and i hated it but i mean it's it's actually uh it's great it's actually pretty fun dude i don't think there's any more joy that i've ever had at someone else's expense was when they dropped in with a bolton shot plus one thinking they're getting a free go again and you just say whoop Parable of suck my ass is what you drop yeah. on the board and say thank you for your turn. And tragic, like yeah. I did that to somebody actually this weekend. I came in for bolden shot and I was like parable and they. I mean, that was like my third aura I just put on board and they just like, oh man, 
<laughs> just lost. Literally just lost the game right there. But it's crazy. Ors are so unfair. They are, and they're they're coming in. Obviously, you're paying four for them, so it's a two card pitch just to get it out there. But ultimately, there are so many fun ways to get it through. I remember uh, one of my very again, I, I don't claim to be a, a you know a world class card player. So when what what I might describe as a very sweet ass play, others might be thinking it's just you know it's it's bush league. Ultimately, I was playing in the top eight, and my opener was. Pitch, uh, pitch yellow uh, war tune to play the uh, miraging metamorph, and in my hand was Oterath and in a blue like a shimmers or something. So when they popped it, I was just testing the waters. I'm like, either it's free damage or they pop it or they, you know, um, either way the aura's coming out. But they went to go pop it, and I cheated out the Oterath, which gave me a free token of a second Oterath. So it's like you're just doubling down. I was like, great, no problem. I'm all for it. And then swing Ode for three and swing Ode for three. And at the end of the day, it just felt like a, a, a that it's an enjoyable experience for us because we're on that side of the board. But I'm telling you, man, it is. it takes some finesse to, to master, and of which you have done. Um, you know, and, and you've imparted a lot of that wisdom on me, which is awesome. Again, I can't thank you enough for that, which has been a great experience. Cause I don't say I'm not an easy student, but I like, I, for me, it's, it's, You're it's, an easy student. You're an easy student. all right. Um, so we got, you got the pro quest win under the belt. You got more pro quests coming down the, the pipe, but, uh, you know, with the pro tour coming to New Jersey in May, your commitment and grind just for for learning decks is, in my opinion, is legendary. It's top tier. It's it's very impressive. I can go back to the fact that when you and I were in Philadelphia at that, uh, in the basement of that of that <laughs> casino, jamming games until like ten thirty at night when the it was venue like 11, was it was eleven. The venue had been closed for an hour, and I'm just dying of I'm tired out of my ass, and you're basically. Yeah. All right, like one more game, one more game, one more game. This is what this is what <laughs> champions are made. I'm like, oh my god. I'm like, okay. So, yeah. you so just that had to keep playing. This is it's play some legends a game of repetition. You just, you play a lot, and uh, yeah, like some of the, some of the things that I used to think about, like when I first started off, is like momentum, momentum, momentum. But like, I, I still think about it, but like it's it's not as as a I don't have to make a such a conscious commitment to it anymore because I played so much, so like I can kind of naturally feel like who has the momentum here, who's doing what, who's actually winning, because, like, life is not an indicator of who is winning flesh, the game of Flesh and Blood, and I cannot stress that enough. It does not matter who has the most life. Like, it, it is... I was playing Viscerai in top eight, and I was down 30 to 30 to three, and um, I had five oars on board. So, like, he had a bad turn. He stumbled. Um, that's what I call it when people don't have go again against Prism. They stumble. Um... And he had to attack an or, and that's when I looked at him and I was like, okay, yeah, he just lost. Like, he had already used up all his equipment, so I knew everything I did, he was going to have to commit from hand. Um, I had four ors on board, and then I started my turn off by playing another older rap. So, like, I have five ors now, each coming in for three if it hits, and two spectral shields. So, 21 damage on board. I mean, and he took it, and then he came back with a subpar turn. I went to two and then killed him. So, I mean, that's... That's how that's how quick it happens. Down from thirty to three, and then I come back and win. So yeah, don't ignore ores, people. Take I always out. I always lean on this quote by uh, Nathan Zamora, aka that's Adam Rulo, who taught me. He said, "One life is infinitely more percentage than zero life." So I was like, <laughs> "That makes sense." Yeah, and that's where you it's go. Not over, it's over. <laughs> it, that's true. Um, a good uh, a a ProQuest winner here in, in Ontario in Toronto, uh, by the name of Raymond Chow, was my opponent in the top eight, and I was. I was just cruising until I got to a misplay, but he I was up about 40 to 11, and he turned it around and won the game 2-0 ultimately, and it was a, a, he was poised, he never faltered, he had a plan, and he found the opening and made it happen, and like more credit to him, but again, like you mentioned, sometimes it's just like, it seems like a daunting task, down 30 to 3, I mean, like, that's that's work you gotta you gotta put in work to get back to there and like not only that but you gotta stay calm so how much of that level of commitment that grind that you have going to the pro quest is this is there another gear that you have leading up to the actual pro tour uh i mean i try to play at least 10 games a day and um i'm constantly thinking about fab pretty much all day like pretty much all day i'm constantly thinking about you know what I can do with my with my decks. Um, I'm constantly watching. Um, I was a, a big fan of watching content creators, but like kind of not so much 
anymore. Um, Except for this show. I mean, obviously, this one yeah, is. Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. I, I normally, I normally <laughs> just try to uh, just have um, just competitive discussions with my team, um, the guys in my testing in, in my testing group. Um, just talking about like, hey, what are you doing in this matchup? How are you siding? Um, which I actually kind of want to put out something about a sideboard guiding because I feel like a lot of people don't know how to side, and a lot of people still don't know that you roll first before you side. I saw so many people this weekend. Both players are already sided, and they're just sitting there like, "Oh, let's roll before we draw up." I'm like, "Good God! Like, what happens if you side something that's just bad going first, right? Like, if you're playing, if you're going second, right? You got a card like Awakening in your deck. You kind of want it, like in your like. You probably would play three because if your opponent comes out swinging, you're like, "Okay, I get a free Awakening and draw and draw up." That's basically like, like what Brian Bissoko says. That's almost like cheating. Like you just start the game with ten sides and surges. And you and four cards in hand, like that's broken, yeah. you know. So, um, you know, but if you're going second or uh, first, right, you don't want awakening. It's literally dead. You're like you're both at forty. So, you know, just just things like that, right? And it's not like what the deck I'm playing, like Prism, right? It's not as prevalent having you know the the knowing who's going first with your siding because for the most part, like the Prism sideboard plan is the same, right? You just play heavy ores into everybody, um, except chain. Um, yeah, that's it. Just play heavy orders on everybody except chain. Maybe a few red D reacts, uh, you know, for the mirror, maybe a couple of uh cars that can pop phantasms, but for the most part, like the core is the core. Um, and it's it, it's not even like a, a 45 card core, it's it's closer to like a 50 55 card core. Like, you know, there's only a couple of things that come in and go out. Um, so the sideboarding is actually very, very easy. It's an extra element of skill and, and development and, and experience that people have. Again, I my first iterations in Flesh and Blood were just like, okay, here's 80 cards that all work within this one strategy. And going into a matchup, I'm like, I have no idea what the hell I'm putting in and out. So I'd sometimes even walk into ma certain matches with like 68 or 70 card decks. And I was like, what the hell am I thinking? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it's like, I wouldn't even say it's like a skill. It's, it's more so like, if you've been testing, you kind of... You kind of know like what you care about. Like if I'm playing against Viserai or Starvo, I have a sideboard plan, right? If I'm playing against anything else, like I just I just play my game plan. My deck is better than yours. You're not playing Starvo or Viserai, so like you know, like it, it, like I'm I'm and I'm being very literal when I say that. Like my like those three decks are just better than whatever they're gonna play against. So like they probably don't need to actually side cards into you because they're already. You know, doing stuff unfair. Like, if anything, you should be siding into me, and I'm just playing me. Like, that's that's really how it goes. I'm like, I played against a dash player, and I'm like, okay. And I played against a Reinhardt player, and I'm like, okay. Like, I I don't have cards dedicated towards you. I just play my my deck because my deck is better than yours, and I just win because my <laughs> deck is just better than yours. Like, that's how a lot of the sideboarding goes. But if you're if if you're playing against one of the Triangle of Doom, as we, as we've now called it, it's um, it's, it's a thing now, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're playing against one of the Triangles of Doom, you probably do have, have an actual sideboard dedicated to them. But other than that, like, uh, I, don't, I can't think of, you know, unless a matchup is just, like, super unfavored, like, what else What else are people siding against? Like, it's literally your sideboard is just for Viscerai, Starbo, and Prism at this point. I like that take. I like the take of just, like, listen, uh, against... These two, I'll worry about it. I'll have a plan. I'll think about it. But everyone else, against everyone else, I'm the villain, right? So you yeah, have yeah, exactly. Like you're the villain. They have to. They have to adjust to you. Like you don't have to adjust to them. Your deck is better. So they just, you know, like it's not even as a prison player. It's not even worth it to play C and C against Lexi. Like who cares? They like who cares? It, you're you're actually letting them off for a turn if you C and C them instead of like playing another or or like putting you know, more pressure on them, you know, on board wise. So like the, you know, just, that, that's just an example. Like I wouldn't, I, like, I really don't care about Lexi. They no CNCs, like, you know, who, who cares? Right. It's not really, it's, it's letting them off the hook in my opinion. You got to eventually evaluate. It's like, is, is my, if I divert my attention and resources from my game plan to disrupt yours, is that a better use of my time and resources and cards or is developing my own, game plan a better option because like what you mentioned like who cares so if i blow up your arsenal or you i get a few cards from you that's one less turn where i'm not jamming 
an aura on the board or not jamming, uh, you know, a, a, a more dangerous uh, herald, let's say, or keep developing the board that I've got. And that's um, part of it, I suppose, is just, again, being being the, the big bad wolf, so to speak, is, is really part of the game plan itself. It's like, all right, you have to beat me. I'm the baddie here. And I really well, like that. Oftentimes, it's not even like it's not even worth it to like dedicate like actual like there's there there really aren't any actual sideboard cards like in the game like Blizzard is probably one of the closest ones we have but like Blizzard's a bad card right like, I don't really think because if if it was like oh they actually lose go again and they can't pay for it then you know it it, it like if my opponent has a full grip. Like, that's when I would want to blizzard them because I know, like, man, he's coming in for this go again and he has, like, a full grip and he has so many more attacks. But, like, I he has a full grip. So, like, if I blizzard him, he'll just pay the two, you know, and I'm down a card and he's down a card and I still haven't even dealt with the card he's attacking with. So I basically just pitched a card for no reason and he's just going to keep doing his turn. So I think blizzard is, like, one of the ultimate, like, we thought it was good, you know, yeah. trap cards in the game. Um, but like, there really aren't even any, any like actual sideboard cards. I think like um, Dash has one. Like Dissolution Fear is good against the Ore Plan. Like that's probably a a sideboard card. But for the most part, like most decks don't even have like actual cards they can dedicate to a matchup that'll just like really swing the matchup into your favor, right? Like I think the best sideboard card right now is probably two red unmovables into Starbo. Like that's probably the best sideboard card in the game right now. Can say it has saved me. It saved me against two oak bolts, uh in the tournament, and uh, God bless the rest of my uh, spectral shields for tanking the damage. But man, I don't think I did not get a hit for a single Oakenold the entire uh, that entire tournament. I was able to, yeah. so, like you mentioned, <laughs> like you want to talk about what a sideboard card is. Not to mention, let's be real, there was no. And I, I did make a meme about this, so we can see it. We'll show it on the screen here for everybody who is watching this on YouTube. But this is a this is a meme I made. I know you saw it. It was the one where you're sacking uh, the QB. This is my yeah. Dalen Mac as Prism uh, meme. This is my attempt at memery, and I'm garbage at this. But you have to appreciate this. There's no better feeling than when your opponent plays Awakening and you've got an Arclight Sentinel in, in, in the arsenal. So all of those pop... And they're like, all right. And I'm like, hold on a second. I got something to say here, buddy. And then you jam it's, it. It's really broken when you can catch them. Uh, so it, this doesn't happen. There's no way that I say this and it actually play the matchup, right? That like, So when you play against Viscerai and you're playing Prism, they are more than likely, almost 100%, going to go the mid-range game plan and try to beat your face in. If by some chance they are actually on the OTK plan, which I they, they shouldn't be, but like... My opponent that I was playing just so happened to be on that plan for some reason. Um, if they're on that plan, then, like, when they pop their Skeletta, they play their Sonata, they search their cards. If they don't have the Rattle Bones, then you play Arc Light Sentinel, which you won't know that they have the Rattle Bones, right? Um, but, like, you play Arc Light Sentinel, and then their turn's just over. Like, unless they, like, like they have to have Rattle Bones to get out of the situation, or they just probably, like, like They'll probably still end the turn by like attacking the Arclight Sentinel, and they'll have like five cards in hand, which is nice for them. But you basically just they, I mean, you stop them in their tracks. They did nothing, and you get to keep playing, and they have to start over. So I mean, they they still get the room chance, but like they have to start over. Like they don't get the actual full pop off turn, making the room chance and all that stuff. Especially when you catch them on, they go. Skeletta, Morgatide, Sonata, and you catch them on that turn, then they waste their Morgat and everything. Like, it's just, it's too much. They can't handle it. Um, it is risky, though. Um, I think that's another thing, like, right? Like, good Vis, good Vis players will know, hmm, he probably has Arclight Sentinel and Arsenal, or just if, if, even if he doesn't, play around it because that, that the card that probably blows you out if he has it. So, like, I don't, like, why would you not attest for it? You know, so I wouldn't. I would never pop off on a prison player um, without having rattle bones in hand, but you know that's that's just another thing that determines good vis players and bad vis players. Because bad vis players will be like, oh, I have twenty room chance, I'm just going to get him here. You know, it doesn't matter what he does. But when when in reality, it actually does matter what I do because if I have the arc light signal, your turn is just bad. 
and yeah. then you just lose for no reason. Yeah, don't give any Vis players any good ideas. That's all I gotta ask. Because again, like I said, that's one of the hardest matchups for us us Prism folk. Uh, well, can yeah, I? Well, if you're playing the OTK, then like you, you probably should already win anyways. Because I mean, <laughs> you're playing a bunch of auras. Like it's like you're playing the Vis version of their deck, right? They're trying to build up room chance. You're trying to build up auras, and you're probably gonna win that race pretty handily if they're not attacking with a lot of go again and you're putting out two ores a turn is it safe to say you're a prism main now <sighs> uh i'll probably have i mean we've played prism so i think i've played this deck more than any other deck i've played in this card game so unfortunately i am a prism uh prism main now um sadly <laughs> i do like some of the i do like some of the art on the cards like i actually started looking at like what the actual cards look like I've never been a person that actually looks at the cards. I just read what they do and play them. I don't really care what they look like, but Dude, this, a, <laughs> this deck has a lot of nice art. <laughs> a blinged out prism deck with all foils is one of the most prettiest things to get trounced by if you're if your opponent is playing that. And uh, I gotta say, it's just it's a thing of beauty. It, it absolutely is. And I sometimes tell when I tell people I'm bringing prism, they look at me like I'm a blue player from Magic. You know, like they have that kind of. <laughs> hatred for you because you're doing stuff at instant speed and messing with their uh messing with their mojo but um one of the things that you're also uh, well if for people who don't know one of the things that i've learned about you is that you're constantly fiddling and adjusting and tweaking your deck and it's amazing because I, I i feel like i have to message you at least two or three times a day to be like hey what's the latest spice like what's the latest tune that we're listening to yeah. what frequency are, are we on because you're constantly changing it and i'm i'm not a deck builder you're the one who's doing all the work i'm merely riding your coattails and stuff but when you it's it's there's so much that goes into it how i want i gotta ask you this how many times did that deck change from the time you picked it up to the time you won your pro quest oh man like drastically right so like going into philly um going into philly i just picked the deck up so i'm expecting a shit ton of star road and uh, there was i just wasn't i wasn't able to play any i played one i beat him 35 to nothing and I kind of thought that the matchup was free, as it, you know, Prism versus Guardians always been free. So I kind of just ignored the fact that it was free. So, um, and then I ran into Chain, and I realized that I had no chance whatsoever. So then the deck changed a lot from there. Um, there was some stuff that I liked, some stuff that I didn't like, and then Tard posted uh, his chain list. So I said, okay, well, a lot of you know, Fab is the king of net deckers, which there's nothing wrong with net decking. Um, Especially when the meta is solved like it is now, like everyone's list pretty much looks exactly the same. Especially in the Star Wars decks, like the, Charles Dunn just got the math right first, and like it, it would just be stupid not to play the math that he had in his list because he his math works. But um, so I I needed some stuff for Chain because Tar posted his list. Um, have not played Chain since Philly, but you know if I do, I'm ready. Um, and then after, you know, my locals, I lost that pro quest. I um, lost my winning into Viserai. So I kind of started looking at um, stuff for that I could play for Viserai. So I think I added, like, a few sinks, um, a few fate for scenes. And then I started testing uh, more against Brine um, because Starbo was, I saw how popular Starbo was. So I figured it was going to get even more popular than it already was. You know, it had a great first weekend. Uh, Charles Dunn had won with it, you know, the week prior. So did a lot of Starville testing, and then I realized that the Starville matchup was not actually as free as I thought, because Brian was beating the crap out of me. And I was like, dude, like, I don't know if it's just you or, <laughs> you know, what, but it, and it, as it turns out, it is just him. Like, he's just nasty with the deck. <laughs> but, uh, so I decided, okay, I have to figure out something to do about Okanold, because that's, that's the only one you care about, right? Every other one is like, you can throw a card at it and block it enough, like Crippling Crush. You can block enough of Crippling Crush to make sure you don't get crushed. Um, Okino, though, having to block an 11 Dominate when you got a handful of ores that don't block is literally impossible. Um, unless you play red unmovable, right? Like, So that was the card that, uh, that I changed. I was originally playing the yellows because if it ever came up where I needed a yellow, at least unmovable wouldn't, like, it wouldn't be dead. But um, unmovable, red unmovable blocking for eight is like, perfect right that's you you literally just play from arsenal and a card from hand and that's all of okinawa and that's all you care about you just care about being able to fully block okinawa 
Um, and so I did that. Um, played against um, a Starbucks player in like round four and then in the finals of the of the Pro Quest. And the Starbucks player in the finals just got dugged on. Like I played like triple tome in a turn. And after that, like, you know, I could see it on his face. He was like, well, I guess I'm not going to New Jersey. I'm not getting this PTI. <laughs> And then even after that, like, even after I won, like, I was still uh, looking at stuff to improve. And, like, I drastically changed it again. So, uh, folks told me, my, my folks told me, like, a week before, which I mentioned him two weeks before. I said, hey, we should look at Crown, a reflection. And then he, like, kind of looked into it. And then he texted me and said, you should think about playing Tunic and Prism. And I was always like, why would I play Tunic? You know, Vestige probably creates more mana throughout the course of the game than Tunic. But the card that is the underlying factor in all this is Crown of Reflection. And I saw Hayden Dell in his Midian um, gaming um, Midian gaming uh, progress that he won. Um, he was playing uh, Crown of Reflection. And I was thinking, I was like, huh, it's really nice to be able to pop a Spectral Shield, play a zero-cost aura, keep your action point. So, like, if they want to flash in Genesis or something, you can still attack it. So you basically got to play, like, a zero cost at instant speed, which might not seem like it's, like, that broken, but, like, that literally is how the matchup is played. Like, if if you can, like... Because it starts off, like, everyone's just trying to fight for, like, board presence, right? They're trying mm-hmm. to put out two ores a turn, get further and further ahead, and then kind of win from there. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Crown of, Crown of Reflection definitely deserves to be in in the matchup in the mirror match and if you're playing crown of reflection instead of halo there's no reason to play tone and if you're not playing tone there's no reason to play vestige and then you know so it actually did end up making sense but i kind of got up a bit of a hybrid build now because i'm playing uh i'm playing halo into some matchups and i'm playing um crown into some matchups just particularly like the mirror match and uh viscera i'm playing right. crown and then uh I still like Tome against um I still like Tome against Starvo. Like it's it's just it's just such a blowout for them. Um, you can pull off like, just these yeah. big turns of just drying up and drying up and drying up, creating extra mana off of the fact that your vestige is just giving you a little extra a little extra jam off of each card you pitch. Um yeah. if, well, uh, you've been ultra ultra successful, and the road is not over yet. Like you mentioned, you will be in New Jersey. You still have some other ProQuest if you just want to sort of collect a little bit of extra clout. Why not, man? Just kick the doors down. <laughs> yeah, I got um, I got one this weekend at Reaper. Um, I got one next weekend at Team Covenant, and then the weekend after that is um, Indy. So beautiful. Literally, it's been what Philly, my locals, Houston. Um, Reaper this weekend, Covenant, and Indy. Yeah, six straight weeks of uh, Flesh and Blood nonstop. Oh. Awesome. Loving it. My deck has evolved literally every event. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm excited to see how it changes because even before we started recording this, you're like, I got new, I got a new hotness I got to show you, and yeah. I was excited to see it. <laughs> Which All is right. great, man. This is great. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, no. I was gonna say, uh, it, it is. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is. It is absolutely great. The fact that the, the deck keeps evolving, but again, it's sort of mm-hmm. all. Si- it's it's all meta, focused the meta on the- itself. Is just like, uh, well, I would say the meta, the the meta decks. You know, Viscera, Starbound, Prism are like evolving. Not so much. Not so much Starbound. Um, like I said, Charles Dunn got it right. Like that is the maps. Those are the numbers you play. You know, that's a pretty soft deck for the most part. I guess the only thing you could do is. Maybe sign in a few tech cards, but like you don't want to mess up the ratio. So I'm not sure. I didn't talk to Brian. I'm not sure what it looks like now. I just know how I would approach it. Um, and then Viscera. I think Viscera is one of the decks that have evolved um, very, very nicely. And I think will be, I'll say it again. I think if you are a good Viscera player, you would do very well at any. <laughs> Well, I hope I don't meet any good Viscerai players uh, moving Man, forward. Uh, <laughs> Dale, and I do appreciate you again coming back on the show. We do have another segment called Go Again. You've done it before. Are you ready for another yeah. round? I am ready for another round. Awesome stuff, ladies and gentlemen. All right, hang tight. We will be back with Go Again with Dale and Mac right after these words from BCW Supplies. Instant Speed is brought to you by BCW Supplies. Go to BCW Supplies and use the code ISP10. Get 10% off your order. Support the podcast. Today, I want to show you this really cool thing called a gaming box. This is the Prime X4 XL. So many L's. 
Uh, this is the XL version. Now, this is a wonderful storage device that you can have that, uh, you know, you're carrying around and this just keeps everything consolidated, safe, and organized. So, why carry this around? Like, I see it all the time. I was there and I'm carrying my backpack everywhere. I got dice in one pocket, my deck box here. I've got slabs of magnetic cases for all of my valuable stuff, but it's all just kind of scattered. So, why not consolidate it into this? And I'll show you how this works. You bust this bad boy open and check this out. You've got all kinds of different wonderful storage options. So how about we start loading this bad boy up? Let's go. All right, tons of dice, counters that are now falling all over the floor. Jam them in here. There they go, perfect. I've got so many of these and you know that when you're jamming in with all kinds of counters on your equipment, on your auras because you're playing prism and winning with it shimmers is going to put some counters on stuff there you have it all right let's keep going i got my prism list as well top eight of the, the harry t pro quest with this prism list let's jam this in here why not hey good to go nice and snug but here's the rub my friends here's a little bit of the hubbub where are we going to put these hard cases well the beauty of this case over here is you've got some of these little sections that are removable so now we can go ahead Put some of these slapped cards, the very, very careful protected ones, jam it in there, close it up, seal, kaboom, it's good to go. Hey, let's turn it upside down. What happens? Absolutely nothing, because it's all secure, friends. Nothing is moved, nothing is disturbed, it's all safe, and here we go. Room for multiple decks, dice, slapped cards, the whole nine yards. Go to BCW Supplies and use the code ISP10, get 10% off your order, support the podcast, you know you want it. All right, it's time to go wide on Dale and Mac as we go again on a series of rapid fire questions. And this is not just Dale and Mac. This is ProQuest winner Dale and Mac. He has upgraded. He has evolved. Are you ready, Dale? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. My new favorite question to lead off with is always, what is Dale and Mac's hidden talent? My hidden talent? Um, secretly, I'm a futurist. Like Tony Stark and oh. <laughs> Yeah. That is my secret talent. Most people don't know it, but uh you know, every time someone comes to me and I already know what they're gonna ask me, you know, I just they always think, Oh man, how did he know? And I'm just like, uh, I'm a futurist. I was you gonna know? say Sometimes, like, uh, I just get a random message from you, and it, it literally just says, st I don't have a new prism list. I'm like, oh, I was about to ask you. I was just about to ask you. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, how late to the deadline do you finalize your deck? So normally, um, normally it's, like, three or four days before, like, the actual tournament. But right now, like, there's just so much testing going on, and the meta is the, you know, the data is getting presented because it's ProQuest season. Um and the constant upgrades that I'm making to the deck, um, you know, it's it probably like the day, but the day was the day before last week. Um, so I literally grabbed after Brian beat the mess out of me all all week on Starville. Uh, I literally was like, okay, I'm going to the shop to pick up some red on mobiles, and that's pretty much all the testing that I did, um, adjusting that I did. I was like, okay, I should either put this deck this card in, or I'm just going to get obliterated, and so. Um, yeah, so that was like the day before. But for this week, I'm like, I'm already already got a list ready. So normally four days, but last week a day. <laughs> so what was your Wanderlick test score? Now, for those who don't know what that is, maybe you can also enlighten them. Uh, yeah, so Wanderlick is um, like um, when you when you go to the uh, NFL draft, um, if you ever go. It's a I mean, I was thinking very, about it. Like, I I got nothing to do this weekend. Actually, no, I have a pro quest, <laughs> so I can't go to the I can't do the combine. It's but a very uh, <laughs> overrated experience. Um, it's terrible. They keep you up all. They keep you up at um from six, and you stay up until two. So I don't understand how you're an athlete, and they've always preached about taking care of your body, getting proper rest, and they keep you up literally all weekend before you have to go run and do all these drills that determine the fate of your life. But anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> a Wonder Lake is a test that they basically test to see what your IQ score is pretty much, essentially. I don't know why they don't just call it an IQ test, but yeah. Um, I did not get my... You don't get your results back. You only get them back if you do bad. Um, so <laughs> That's I did a not good get sign, I back, guess. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's kind of like when you go and... Uh, actually, I won't say that. <laughs> but yeah, I was gonna say when you go and get tested for uh, yeah, don't even worry about it. But um, yeah, um, 
it's just yeah, it was that's... fascinating because um I was driving home from the ProQuest and listening to sports radio and they were talking about the the, the Wanderlick test and they were saying about how they're like, oh, you know, Aaron Rodgers scored a 39. And basically what it is, is it's you have 10 minutes to complete as many of 50 IQ testing questions. And that is your score. How many ever correct you get? So the max you can get is 50. Only one NFL player in history has ever scored a 50. And I think the career low score ever was like a like a four, I think, was like the lowest ever. So uh, I, th- I think you're in, a, you're in a good spot. Also, it was said that I think um, like the, the number one – rated or so the the highest scores were typically uh the the center was like what play the, from position to position centers scored very very high uh and i think it was something like defensive tackles as well were very very high up there and i'm not just saying that to that's interesting because i figured that i figured the quarterbacks do well centers do well um linebackers and then you know defensive tackles are probably like middle of the pack but yeah, I don't know. I, when, when we took it, right, they just put us like all out there, and um, you know, no one was stressing it or whatever. It was pretty easy. Like the, the, it was pretty easy. Like there were no really hard questions. Um, so super simple. Here's a for those who want an example. Here's an example. Um, you, if cookies cost a dollar and oranges cost seventy five cents. How many of each would you have to buy to spend eight dollars and twenty five cents? That was one of the Wonderlic questions. Uh, if, if, just to give everybody an example, so uh, eight dollars and twenty five cents. What is that? Just four of each? It's uh, no. it's it was three oranges and six cookies. I think is the answer. Oh, um, but it's okay. There goes my Wonderlic. There goes my <laughs> There you go. All right, here's it's, another it's one. It's choice, though, so I guess you just, like, plug it all in and oh, see which yeah. one math hits. Yes. <laughs> Eliminate the ridiculous answers, and then really, it's a, then it's a coin flip, and you're good. Um, yeah. This question was not on the Wonderlick test, but I know you're going to ace this one. Um, Charmander, Bulbasaur, or Squirtle? Squirtle. Easy. Dude, Last same. Nice I don't know why everyone, everybody leans towards Charmander, and then there's this, like, crew group of people who are all about, you know, the grass types, but it was Squirtle the whole way for me, man. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Squirtle. I, I even like the new ones that they just released, the duck. I'm getting the duck for sure from Scar- Pokemon Scarlet and uh, Violet. <laughs> What's the duck's name? Uh, Quaxley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the fire type, I think he's like a crocodile, but he's like an apple crocodile. So people are mad because they wanted to be named Apple Gator. I'm a big Pokemon fan for anyone, for all you viewers watching, so... Oh, that's that's trust me. I follow at Dalen Mac on Twitter. I knew all about. That's why this could conversations in here right now. That was uh, all right. Uh, what is the what card did you either drastically overestimate or underestimate from Everfest? I overestimated fractal replication. I thought that card was going to be busted. It's not. It doesn't even make the cut for the deck. I underestimated um, dissolution fear um, and dash. Uh, it plays very. It plays in the prism very well, um, just because because you, you go like the prism players go heavy ores into everybody. So like, you got like five ores on board, and just Lucian Fear says that you're, they just don't deal damage. So like, you know, you're kind of just looking at them, and they're looking at you, and it's very weird situation. So. All right. Next question is from the Tannen Grace. Uh, this is oh, probably yeah. <laughs> if I were to rank these questions, this one would be second place. Um, better feeling. Winning the pro quest or sacking Joe Burrow? <laughs> Man, that's tough because that game was on like my senior night too, my last time playing in Kyle Field. So I, it, it's sacking Joe Burrow. Uh, that, that <laughs> it's just good. It's just a good feeling to get a sack in front of your, you know, your home stadium. The crowd roars. It's good. The camera follows you all the way to the sideline. You know, you get some clout. It's just, it's really nice. Uh, winning, winning the pro quest is pretty cool too, but like. Yeah, yeah, it's close. It's really, it really is close. When hey, the man. pro tour felt like very good. You sacked a uh, a, um, a Super Bowl finalist, you know, like a Super Bowl uh, number Super... one pick of the, of the draft, like two years later. Damn right, had nothing on you. Did you give him a taunt? <laughs> Did you, what was your taunt after? Did you do that, or what was the story? You, you lay him uh, out, and it's then funny. What? It's funny. Like I actually sacked him, jumped up to celebrate with my teammates, and they all knocked me down, and then have had to pick me back up. So like it, it was very. It's very uh, weird. I don't know why I remember that off the top of my head, 
but uh well yeah. of course you remember <laughs> it you sacked joe freaking burrow it's not like you yeah but that, that was before he was joe freaking burrow now like now he's like Matt Glenn, like he was still a good player but like what he is now he was a shell of that <laughs> back then well if it's any consolation when i see you next in indianapolis you can you could like knock me down and then do the celebration people could film it we could kind of re- <laughs> we could recreate the joe burrow experience and i will be the sacrificial lamb uh next question is what is the coolest or rarest card that you own i guess the rarest card would probably be the, the mage master boots i just won or just sold recently um but the coolest i'd say was um i still have my reveal cards from uh lss that they they let me have so i think those are um pretty cool even though i don't play that class um they'll just always have a hold a special place um even though like they're not even seeing play i actually thought like the high roller for brute would see play skull crushers is kind of whatever because they need gamblers gloves but uh yeah that you know they'll just always have a special place i just keep them sealed and at the house because they just they just mean a lot yeah they're sentimental same with me it's like i got the amulet of, of uh was it amulet of something immolation i forgot what it's called mm. either way it, it, it's not going anywhere it's i know that it like a cold foil amulet is like five bucks but ultimately to me it's priceless and that, that that's that's a great answer yeah. um last question for dale and mac says who do you feel is a player you can always learn from i think anybody you watch play this game um you learn either what not to do or what is a good play so i think you can always learn by like watching the match um just to see like how like you know if you're watching two new players play right like and they were you know showing like new player ten- tendencies like what new players do like they throw their equipment super early you know that's i guess an indicator of how huh, i'm playing against a guy that doesn't really know how to play right so like you're learning like what a how to play against a new player right the tendencies that they'll go through or if you're playing against an experienced player you know some of the things that they do an experienced player will do is um they will always they will always correctly announce um the phases right they'll go coming in for this any blocks they won't just say put their attack down like most people do and just let their opponent you know go straight to reactions right they'll put their attack down and they'll go any blocks or um any reacts or when you know when you get to the reaction phase um and that's that's what like it's very important to be consistent with that because when people when people go from doing it all the time saying any blocks any reacts and they go just put it down and they don't say anything that means they actually probably do have a react and they you know want to bait you into a situation you know or vice versa so i think that's uh you know i think you can always learn from both experienced and um and um, under experienced players. But like, as far as just like, um, just like team talks and meta discussions, I mean, you know, the discord, all the guys in there, like our secret, the, our the super te- ex- secret and exclusive discord. Uh, yeah. We're always in there testing, uh, theory crafting meta. It's crazy. Um, if, if you're not into, in the discord, um, I'm sorry, you're missing out, but <laughs> we had what five or six winners ProQuest winners in the last like two weeks. Yes, and, uh, and ultimate top eight. Yeah, multiple top eight, like ten top eighters. No, not only that, but multiple national champions as well. Yeah, and, multiple uh, national champions in there. Everything we got the whole mix. And that's one thing I gotta say. Like, I don't know how. I, I feel like I snuck in like a cat in, in the winter. You know, like oh, through man. through through the garage door or something that was left open. And I'm just there. I'm like until they figure out that I'm a complete and utter scrub i will just continue to fly like fly high but hey yeah, like i said you, you can't even use that card no more you, you top top aided harry tarantula one of the most stacked that is that probably is the most stacked pro quests in like pro quest season and you got you went five you were second in swiss that's insane i know i gotta say i'm i i like i think that it's i'm, I'm eventually coming through it's a little challenge that i have where uh, it's like imposter syndrome, right? Like you, you, you always feel like everything's a fluke, and it just happened, be- not necessarily because of your own 
uh, doing, which kind of leads me to the, the like a, a side discussion here that I guess we can dedicate a few seconds to. Like one of my matches against the dude that I was in the driver's seat for for the whole thing. When it was over, I, it basically I was given no credit for the win and was told that if I if I was played against again, I would lose, and that I basically the entire game was decided by their shuffling, which in which I was just like, okay, what whatever you say, like it was that kind of That's fun experience. Crazy. Yeah, I always try to be. There, there's variants in card games, so like I always try to be. I always try to have. I always try to build good card game karma. Um, I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, no matter who I'm playing, I'm always. Um, I always respect my opponent, right? Because like, you can't just get high rolled and they get beat. Um, but like, there's a lot of times where I know notice that I'm playing a a player that's like not as well versed right kind of under experience you know so um i always just try to be like respectful you know whether whether i'm mad or or not you know i've 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 won a lot you know in in playing cards so like it's not really it's not the end all be all it is tilting when you lose but you know it happens and you need to like like when you lose around you need to forget about it like, like immediately just like because if you lose around and let's just say this if you lose a round but you win all the rest of your rounds it, it doesn't matter anymore <laughs> like who cares that you lost a round which is what happened to me i lost my round one of the pro quest and i went eight straight so i mean just like forget about it you can't do anything about it so like why you know only what i think there's like a quote is like only a fool gets tripped up tripped on what's behind him or something like that that's a like it's, very valid yeah. quote yeah 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 so like you know, move on. It's over. You can't do anything about it. You, if you beat the next guy, then then you're on a winning streak. You know, so like that. That's that's it. Just keep stringing. Just all you just want to do is just keep stringing success together. So just take it round by round. Don't look at the standings. Don't look at where you're at. Just round by round. Don't you know? I I can't even say um, that I feel pressure once the event starts. I'm always nervous before the event starts because you never know what to expect. But, um, you know, when I'm actually playing, there's really no pressure because I just, you know, I always just try to make the correct play. And whether the variance happens, the variance happens. But in flesh and blood, you know, the better player normally wins. And that is that is the truth. The better player normally wins. So if you play well and better than your opponent, you will probably win. And that is very, very true in this game. It's a fascinating thing because, like, moving into the sixth round of Swiss, there's a lot of people who were more worried about what their their tiebreakers were than mm. just winning the next game. And I would just, yeah, I, and they would be stressing about it. And I said, "Listen, I'm like, the best thing you can do is focus on this game and win it, and then it's up in the air. But if you're worried about tiebreakers without even playing the game, your focus is misplaced, and you should be focusing on your opponent. So win the game." And then yeah. you're putting yourself in the best possible position for success. So just take it. It all boils down to just win the game that you're playing next and, and, and just go from there. So um, good advice. And like I mentioned, like you learn from every opponent that you play from. And I've learned a lot from you, Dalen. So again, from myself to you, thank you so much for uh, the tutelage, the senseiism, I guess it is, <laughs> that you have provided me. And I, I know there's going to be a lot more of me uh just sitting in that discord with you jamming games and wondering what the hell am i doing wrong here what am i doing <laughs> different right after this <laughs> oh, yeah right after let me eat <laughs> first let me eat and then we'll get back to gaming but dalen thank you so much again my friend for being on the show it's always a pleasure and i can't wait to uh to just uh not just jam games with you because that happens all the time but actually s sitting across the table where you're like one more game flake one more game <laughs> yeah that's fine there'll probably be a lot of that in indie so <laughs> plenty plenty indeed uh all right uh, for all of those who want to get more dale and mac aka uh tampa bay bandit dale and mac aka ProQuest winner dale and mac where can they get more dale and mac <laughs> uh just add dale and mac on uh twitter um yeah that's me yeah and don't ask him for invites to our super secret uh discord because yeah. uh that, tannin is uh the gatekeeper there so yes go go <laughs> go buzz at uh tannin tannin uh, grace's gate because he's the yeah like he's the gatekeeper but uh yeah thank you so much ladies and gentlemen for listening don't forget you're not losing if you're learning so keep playing the game you might win we'll see you next week on the instant speed podcast well, I